Welcome here to the Institute for Sustainable Resources. My name is Marvin Bleichwitz. I'm Professor and Deputy Director here at the Institute for Sustainable Resources. And it is my special pleasure today to announce our seminar with our distinguished speaker of today, uh, which is Marco Venelius. Uh, I think I've heard about you 10 years ago, the first time, when I came across the World Business Council and Vision 2050. And at that time, I heard the mastermind behind this Vision 2050 is a guy called Marco Villenius. And then our ways are sometimes crossed. We met then incidentally in the, uh, in the project which is Recreate, a uh, European Union project uh, with two researchers of our institute as we being here, where you are the advisory board and I'm part of the project team. So I'm quite happy to now have you here as a seminar speaker. And uh, the uh, topic that you would like to discuss with us is uh, called here, Surfing the Six Waves, uh, wave, which probably relates to the convertive cycles, these long-term cycles of more radical type of innovation with smart resource use, some reflections and case studies. So I certainly look forward to your presentation and discussing with you afterwards. Let me just also use half a minute to make the usual announcement. There is no planned fire alarm, so if there is any fire alarm, please leave the room. Please also take care of security issues. This is an unprotected room, so don't leave anything here um, unnoticed. And the format of our uh, discussion is, as usual, I would say, uh, that we invite you to speak for some 40 minutes. This will be followed by a Q&A with the audience, which is usually a very lively part of about half an hour. And then we all can go upstairs, where we can serve some drinks and nibbles with you, where we can have a more informal chat. And the whole thing will then close now at 7.30, and uh, we look forward to the whole thing. Uh, Mark Galenius, I would say without further ado, the floor is yours, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. I could say more about you, but I realize the second slide is actually <laughs> about you, so we may better say more about you yeah. and what you currently do yeah. as part of your presentation. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you for your invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, when I finished my school somewhere in the early 80s, I had a great urge to come here to London for whatever reasons. Um, and I eventually uh, was able to find a job here. Actually, it was in north of London, in Watford, and, and there was a rehabilitation center for mentally handicapped people. So I spent there a year, and it was a great year for a young guy like me because it was, it was uh, the, the distance was short enough to make all the weekend trips over to here, to London, and, and, and I was a great fan of uh, uh, music and, and blues in particular, and so I could get all the, all the nice um, uh, bands of that time um, uh, to be heard. Um, and ever since there has been a connection, and, and, and so it's a, once again very nice to be here. Um, and I um, really want to um, uh, explore the issues that I might think that are of interest to you when we think about um, um, uh, sustainable resource use. And uh, but before going into the heart of the matter, I, I, I just like to say something about my background so you can kind of contextualize what, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk. So I've been in the business of future studies, I think, um, more than 20 years now. And um, it all started actually because uh, there was a one a certain um, 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 professor of business management in Finland in the 70s who wanted to really to go into the future studies. And, and so he was one of the real pioneers and one of those guys that, that then formed the Club of Rome, which then, if you remember, came out with the, the least growth and all that. And, and, and I, I was a young researcher in the, in the early 90s, and I, I was making a study about uh, a sustainability issue. And, and he was on my list, 
for those that I have I wanted to interview and I went to interview him and that changed my life because what he said to me uh, made me to understand that if I want to ever to continue with the academic study that must be something to do with the future studies and so and it was then a couple of years later that I joined this Finland Futures Research Center and though I have been uh, out of there every now and then, sometimes working in, 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 in Germany as I did for a number of years with the, with the global financial giant called Allianz, uh, sometimes uh, uh, shorter breaks um, to the California or elsewhere in the world, I still, that's my kind of a home base and, and we are currently an institute of about 50 to 60 people and actually last week we had just our annual seminar which we gather 250 people uh, interested in future studies professionals on that field and and we have a great uh, two and a half days with us uh, <coughs> to um, identify itself as a futurist means also that um, if there is anything apart from the fact that we are, or oh, I am interested in future, is something that I would say a kind of a holistic uh, approach. I myself was trained as a social scientist, but as I uh, was also very interested in, in, in natural sciences, I went to explore some of that. Then later I became a part of the economics, uh, the school of economics, and thus I, of course, entered in a way also to the, to the economies and so forth. So that's one thing to, to, to gain this different, at least some idea of the different, different disciplines. But then the other sort of a dimension to that is that what I have been trying to do now, um, well, all my professional life basically, is to, to have a different point of view, to, to hop over to the sectors. So not just to be in the academic part, but also go into business, Sometimes I've been working very intensively with the government or in the government, particularly in the Finnish government, but sometimes also some other governments. So this is just to gain the kind of experience and insight that I see that's necessary for me to, um, um, uh, for, my, for, my, for my work as a futurist. And apart from that, I, I'm, I'm currently working with a number of startup companies because that's also something, and been also investing there a little bit to understand what's that kind of world because that, of course, is something that you see emerging the stuff that some of that might become sort of a more dominant in, in the in the business and in the society. Um, and of course, this club of Rome that I joined more than ten years ago has been a great. Um, uh, circle to me because through that I've met a very very interesting people all around the world uh, who share the same passion about sustainability. Um, <clears throat> now um, I have divided. Uh, I had three hours time, wasn't it? So? <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I touch a little bit on how to understand the social change talk a little bit about the, the key trends of the future and then I take some case studies what this is in the practice to build the economy in a smarter way and all this in the kind of context which is uh, which is that under the last I would say two three years I have seen a lot of interesting new developments on, on this on this premises anything that has to do with the sustainability and it's not all anymore the old paradigm of let's do and fix something in the environment, but it's really about understanding uh, not only the environment, but social system and natural system as a whole system. So it's really about the whole system's thinking, and I'm going to show you some some implications of that in the course of in the course of this. Now, I was last month, most of the last month, I was in California. And you know what people are talking about in California these days? Talking about the drought. The very, 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 very intensive drought that has been there now for about four years or so. 
And the fact is that when you talk to the people that really know something about it, they say that, well, they have less than 10 months time to find out when they get fresh water sufficiently for this amount of population. So they have already cut down and they have given new policies to cut down water or the consumption, but that's not going to do enough. But be, if you go beyond that, you start to think, what's actually going on? How is it possible that a state, which is the world fourth largest economy, if you take a California, and which is damn rich, can be brought into this kind of situation? where there is an absolute shortage of the water. And they have been not able to fence against it in any real sense. They have just been driven into this kind of situation. So what does it really tell about society? As rich, as educated, as it is. So, that I would also call a paradigm shift in terms of that some people really don't understand and now it's, it's not an issue of a single environmental problem but it's a much more fundamental issue about how we understand the different loops in the society, in the economy and of course in the end individual lives of the people that adds up to something which no one has a control over. This is a really <laughs> can hardly see. <laughs> okay, uh, but you see the you see the blue line here. So <clears throat> this is something uh, <clears throat> that I have been developing over the years. This is not my invention, but the interpretation is mine, and it's about as Raymond was um, a little bit in sort of introducing, is really about uh, understanding the long-term cycles in the society and in the economy. And this is the only way for me, actually, uh, to make sense what's going on. Namely, that there are these dynamic patterns in our societies that enable us to understand why when certain periods come up or end up with a crisis and while the next phase is that together with means that are not the ones that we have been using before we get out of this crisis so we are living between the fifth and the sixth wave now and of course the real question is the what what, what's the sixth way? Which assumably would take us somewhere to the half or the mid of this century. So what does this really consist of? And if you look at this pattern of drivers that has brought us up to this point, right from the birth of the industrialization, we see that, of course, this is not the whole thing, but as I said, these are the drivers. And, and when you look at this point, uh, at, at, at this way, the evolution being or changing itself, revolution at some point, and taking us further, <laughs> the implication of this next change is something where if you look at it from, from particularly from the economy point of view, we say that okay, we have 200 years of heavy focus towards labor productivity and now for the reasons that I think are quite clear to us we are moving not to look anymore so much about the labor productivity, but the resource productivity. So materials and energy production and distribution, 
may be combined with one island and left out this um, idea of how to actually to hu use human capital in a new way. And this is itself a complex system where we actually are looking for intelligent solutions. Just yesterday, my hometown, the city of Helsinki, a real small town compared to London, but if you take the vicinity of Helsinki, it's 1.5 million, so it's, it's, it's still something. So the city of Helsinki and the energy company that city owns decided that they will not going to continue the old way of producing energy or enhancing their capacity, which they were actually planning to do. Um, but then something happened. I'm, I'm a part of the 10 professors group that started to speak out in the public that this is stupid that we are still in the mode of centralized energy while we see that the real interesting and also economically viable way to enhance the energy production in the city would come from more decentralized model where you start to use smart grids, geothermal energy in different forms, other renewables like a wind and solar and so forth. And we put those decision makers against the wall to understand that unless you are now making the break to the old, we are going to be left behind financially, socially, politically, and technologically. And first they were saying, no, 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 no. come on, you guys in the margin, don't talk. But we sort of raised our voices, and, in the, and yesterday they decided to actually follow what we said. This is one aspect of it, what I was saying, that now the tides has changed. And I don't know if it feels here that way, but certainly I see it happening here. Certainly I see it happening in the European Commission also. And Raimund was uh, uh, implying that, that, uh, that we are working on the common project there. I've been there in the last one, during the last year more than I have been ever, you know, up until that point. And I see that there is a new serious interest to understand sustainability not only as a as a burden but also as a way to renew our thinking and our economy and our technology base and actually even to think about the, the, the competitive edge that the European Union should have um, uh, if it's ever going to survive the next era. So this is the complex, and I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through, but some of the key megatrends which are obvious to you, some of the key innovation platforms that are all, also um, um, pretty obvious to you, and the, some of the key trajectories for social change, as I call them, all of them just building this whole idea that we are actually moving towards um, uh, intelligent solutions, as I spelled it. But again, this comes back to this idea of the system thinking and, and, and the way we can understand the, the, the societal development. Sorry, before you go, can you just tell us what it says in the other talk? Because you can't, you can't read it. It's like well, the, the yellow one, the yeah. search for resource productivity. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about this um, <laughs> technology. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, because what is interesting here is that when we look at the next phase, economically, the situation will be a radically new to what it was before. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Um, this is, this is the axis where this runs the timeline from 2000 to 2015. And um, 
and you and you just can imagine that when we start from here and we have here uh, uh, the GDP growth percentage average annual rate and of course this is a projection projection and 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 no one really knows what's going to happen but I think it's a somehow a signal that when you think the other issues that are affecting us, namely the demographic change in particular, um, the dramatic uh, issue around aging and longevity, which is greatly advancing, uh, 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 contributing to whole thing, then you see a very different sphere also, where it's not any or more this type of growth that we used to see in the last century, but much, much slower. But in that kind of a climate, I think we have a very new possibility to bring up the sustainability topic. And it happens in many ways. The one way that it happens is that this is another uh, projection that I took actually uh, from OECD. Uh, and if there is something um, that you can, you know, um, <coughs> take take account, is that what we what what you already know is that this kind of a tidal change, where non -E -E OECD countries became become the the predominant players in the global economy. Now, what's interesting in here is that if you look here, if you if you look London. Germany, and if you look Finland, and you look how old-fashioned we are in a lot of things that has to do with the infrastructure because of the old culture, and then we think that okay, the the, the heavier the burden you have from the past, the the more difficult you there is to to, to make the leap. And then you start to think that okay, if this is this is what is self-evident that this is going to happen, this kind of a domination going towards uh, non-OECD countries. So where does the innovation come from in that case? I would say they come in the future more and more from those countries that are not part of the OECD. So in order to understand what's happening next and particularly what's happening next after next we really need to look much more into those countries that we sometimes call developing or least developed but all of these are I think very bad actually uh, titles so this is this is the kind of a playground we are talking about when we're talking about the next era the sixth wave Um, and this must be something very familiar to you as well, that how to measure this uh, and what's, what are the types of indicators that we can use to make the point clear. And this is still the one which is about the most substantial to me, which is about the commodity prices and, sh and really show how the market reacts to the issues that happens between uh, supply and demand of the market. And if you look the back of the history, wherever there has been a time when the more smarter substitution come to replace the old technologies, the old ways of doing in general, it always happens or it is enabled, at least, by the raw materials becoming too pricey. Because that's the, how the markets work. And I believe that even though we are now in this commodity uh, basket that we are using here, uh, as well as in many others we have been going down, the, the trend is still there. And I, I, and I do believe and, uh, that it's going to be so. The odds are that it's going to be so, which means again 
there is going to be a great boost in finding the substitutions. And there, as I said, the problem with, with our own countries are that are we going to be a part of that? Are we going to be on the front line on that? Uh, and this is much because also, if you look at the demand side, the demand side is still predominantly there uh, and increasingly there on, on, on the on the on the non in non on OECD countries. And of course you might say that well we I mean these are just the kind of a speculation towards the future, but I think they are indicative in terms of that if the demand is rising, that of course is a one kind of a constitution constitutional factor to say that a lot of changes are going to come. I, some, I, I did one investigation, what happened in, in Finland in the forest industry 150 years ago. A very interesting case. There was a, uh, you know, up until that time, what was the raw material that was used for paper production? No, before that. Before that. Hmm? Yeah, lumps. Basically. Now, there was a certain amount of lump that was produced, and then when the communication system started to expand, newspapers and the stuff, and suddenly there was there was a situation that it just it just wasn't enough. Well, that produced a great um, um, a search for, for, for a smarter way of, of producing paper. And then some engineers in Germany, Finland, and Sweden, they came up with this solution, which was that, well, let's use the conifer trees for that. It's an endless, endless amount of that. And that's how that was um, uh, done. Now, um, I believe also that when we go to the basics and basic commodities uh, and we look um, the things like the steel, we just cannot think that this type of trend is simply going to continue forever. There cannot be the amount of the raw materials that is there. And of course, this is something that you certainly do a lot of research on, and Raimund particularly, but, so I'm not going to stay here, but this is just a building up my point. Um, because what I, again, I like to more look is this kind of a systemic systems effect that comes out from the different sectors. In this case, it's about the food. And actually, I was just last week talking to European uh, farmers association. And I asked them, and what do you see as a great problem? And they said that, well, their basic problem is that they don't understand how the farmers are going to survive in the future. Because if the, if the harvests are good, the price go down. If the harvests are bad, the price go a little bit up, but still the earnings are really bad. And then I said that, well, when, have you ever thought that the way that you're farming is totally uh, uh, um, uh, counterproductive to your own production. That you are actually sowing your own branch by having this sort of um, cultivation methods. And then we started off, of course, that was a very offense, offensive to do so and to talk about. It. But, but then we started actually to have very fruitful discussion. What's the future like a smart agriculture? Which was, of course, what I wanted to head the whole uh, debate. And, and that's of course the big issue here. So what's the future of the agriculture? Because it cannot go, I mean, the, even though you, you see how the, the, the amount of the harvests, even though with the further and, and, and increasing the fertilization, they have been evening out in the last 10 years. Not going higher, actually going downwards because there is not anymore the type of humus on the top of the soil 
that enable this, this song to be fertile. And you know these things as well, so I'm actually skipping out this because I also see that there is a, a, a little bit of hurry to go into the point. The oily situation is, 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 is also part of the issue, part of the complexity we are talking about, particularly the running out of the so-called cheap oil, which of course we might see it, think it's a very good thing, which it certainly is, uh, which again put the same kind of pressure that I was talk talking about before. Now this is a hard one uh, because this is, this <laughs> but this is this is take this as a metaphor. Because what, what I what I have been working with my students a lot in the last two years is, is really to try to understand this um, economy, but also the, the whole society system, and it's it's not really very easy. Uh, but this is just to demonstrate that what kind of loops there are to understand uh, that, that how the system works as a system. And I don't know how much you can see from here. Uh, I'm using um, now um, a very interesting research group is, that is uh, called Simres that is now actually working for German government for the 2040 sustainability projection. So what's the, what's the really sustainable society from the, from the ground? And I think that they, have, they are doing a marvelous work, very similar to what Pablo Brown was doing already from the 70s, but also in these updates that, that was about uh, the, the globe as a dynamic system. And you can see, even you can't see very clearly, uh, that in each of these um, uh, cases, when we're talking about environment, economy, population, as something like a big, 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 big ch tidal change is about to come from, uh, from 10 to 30 years from now. So there's going to be um, a trajectory that puts so-called development in a very different path. And they have some nice demonstration. I will, I can circulate this um, if you wish, uh, and then you can see also the, the address of, of, of the source. And I, I think this is one of the most interesting um, uh, uh, dynamic simulation uh, that I have seen. Um, <clears throat> and again, it goes back also to the economy. Because what's really the problem, if you look at the economic side of the things, is that we are becoming too dear as economies. And that's why we are so greatly indebted. We are using old-fashioned uh, techniques, you know, old infrastructures, and it's all becoming so dear. And, and I think that even though we see this level of consciousness rising about the environmental issues, it will be ultimately the realization that this type of economy is just too expensive for us, which would make the change. Hopefully together with the raising of consciousness. And now you can see how the desperate the most of the European countries are to fight against that. But it's the kind of a fight that can be only uh, win if you have this extreme amounts of oil like in Norway or extreme financial capacity like Switzerland or extreme rigidity like um, and, and compliance uh, like Germany. Everybody else is in trouble. And Germany will be also in trouble when, when the China goes down inevitably uh, at their economic growth. Right. I use my last five minutes to, um, to talk about the case that illustrates that how, how these things can be changed and what does it take 
if you think any this kind of a more transformative um, um, agendas that we need to have on the part of sustainability. And um, this project that I have been running now um, in the city of Turku, that's, that's where my business school and my university is, and it's the 20, uh, two hours west uh, by train from Helsinki, very nice city, very beautiful. Um, Bastu actually means um, a sauna. That's a Swedish um, 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 uh, a version of sauna. Actually, the Swedes are the only ones that are, have a different name than sauna for sauna. <laughs> I don't know why, but but anyway, and that's a typical sauna in the in the in the Finnish archipelago. And by the way, I'm going to spend tomorrow in the Finnish archipelago. <laughs> Because we have the greatest fiesta of the whole year, the midsummer party, where we have the light as much as, you know, starting from 3 o'clock in the morning, going to 2 o'clock in the next morning. And then there is a one hour in between, which is only a kind of a semi-light. So, well, okay, that was, uh, but anyway, that's, that's, that's what we are doing there is something that I have learned actually, um, oh, sorry, uh, I, have oh, mm. I have learned from um, uh, Silicon Valley. I've been spending there half of my time last four years. And that's not because I would be so fancy about the new technologies, that's fancy too. But I've, what I've been looking at is the new ways of building collaboration. And this collaboration uh, here means uh, that you have to take, take different partners into the play. You have to have entrepreneurs there. You have to have either the city or you know, the whole central government. You have to have a university there. And what we have is, well, in the middle, we have this what we call the intelligent solution, which is so intelligent that it's <laughs> invisible there. Um, and what we have been doing is that um, <clears throat> we have gathered these people with an idea that now we are going to make a new combinations and innovations around sort of a free corners or three pillars which is which one is all about are we, how we are redefining how we use materials that's pretty obvious how we do the new ways of understanding how we can change through use of digitalization or digital technologies how we can change the way what we are using material resources. And then on the top of that, how can we put much more intelligence, so human intelligence and human capital, to rethink everything that we do. So that as a kind of a, as a central agenda, we have gathered the groups together and trying to find out that which way this Turku region, I get well, 250,000 people, about, could be pioneering there, not only in Finland, but large, more largely in, in Europe. What can we do a, a truly a pioneering innovation of reducing materials use using uh, reducing energy use while using these assets that we have and we have been already uh, quite successful uh, so I've never seen that there has been a, such a fierce uh, kind of enthusiasm around as I have seen there when you ask actually people Let's say an entrepreneur, 20 years in the logistics, 
And he has to be always wondering that why on earth, when their trucks come back from what they have been um, bringing somewhere, it comes empty back. That what's the point of that? I mean, never understood. And now, the guy from the next door, who, who, who happens to run a warehouse, comes apart. Yeah, well, okay, let's combine our forces. Actually, I need those kinds of trucks, so we can kind of design a way that we are using this resource more efficiently. And these kinds of cases are now coming more and more, just to illustrate everybody there that this is possible, but it's only possible if we do that in a collaborative way. And if, if everybody joins the party, so to say, and sees the common good, but also sees that there is a special interest for them. So ultimately, we're talking about the human interest. And these people, unlike perhaps some of us, who are enthusiasts for, for the cause of, 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 of environment, these guys are, are perhaps not. But when they see something intelligent that should be done, they will do it. Not out of maybe their own initiative in their own corners, but if they have been um, 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 given a chance to rethink what they are really doing. So again, it's a point of raising the level of consciousness. And it's the same thing what happened, actually, when the whole scene of ICT started to uh, build up from the 70s on, in the fifth way. <coughs> so what was really happening there? What was happening there, there was a building of communication. And that truly created a new communication platform. Now this time, in the sixth way, we are talking about consciousness building in the same way that we were talking about the communication building. And thus, and this is something that makes this so fundamentally different, this era, to what we have seen before. So, all kinds of innovation will start where we are, and, and this is of course what we are seeing elsewhere to happening. The whole issue about the sharing economy, which is actually um, a more towards, I would say, about this, what the sharing society, a very much larger account. And well, <coughs> yeah, well, you've seen in the course of this um, presentation a little bit my, my slides from, 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 from the summer parties, but what I, what I have come up with, uh, what's my kind of a conclusion, is that in order to need to make uh, to, to make the change happen, you basically you need three assets. You might say three competences or three ways of looking at things, which is first systems thinking, systemic thinking, which is about the interactive skills. An ability, ability to stand risks. And I have seen that also with my students that we have been talking a lot about these things and seeing how we are actually redesigning the university courses and the way we are learning and educating so that systems thinking, interactive skills and ability to stand risks becomes an everyday um, life and understanding to the people and to the students. Because if we don't have these, we are going to stick to the end, to the, to the old system, too far, too long, too deep. Because I truly believe that nothing happens really in the big way unless there is first a consciousness that change. Then everything else can change. Well, this is my wife again. I have to have that picture as well. <laughs>
because I like this picture. Well, it's not the whole picture, but she's very determined. So it's like a determined. We need a lot of determination in this sixth way to make our case. And being courage in this sixth way means that you have to be able to say no to a lot of things, even though there are lots of vested interests. And this is, in my experience, working a lot with innovation in, in different environments. It's much easier to actually come up with new innovations than, than to say something about how to get rid of the old. And it's yet a much more important thing. Of course, balance out these two aspects. So maybe my little story about how we change the decision making in the city of Helsinki and then in the energy production is one way to do that because you get easily ridiculed, your questions, your, you know, your expertise or uh, competence anyway. Uh, but unless we do these things, nothing change, really. And we are left in our academic corners so or whatever corners they are. So we have to have a certain kind of belief because of, of course the history shows that everything is possible in the end. Things can change quite dramatically. And that's, I guess, the kind of a wish and a hope that we, we will have it. Yeah, okay, I stopped here. Um, just came out a couple of days ago with my new book, but it's in Finnish. <laughs> so, so, well, if you, if you are interested in having new challenges, read that. Well, it's coming in English in two months. Translate it. Well, tulevaisuus kirja, tulevaisuus, surprise, surprise. In English is future. Kirya is book. So this 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 book is title is the book of future. Um, maybe I, I, I invent a different name in English. I don't know. Ask people here to repeat it. Okay. Well, let's learn some Finnish here. Tulevaisuus kirja. Tulevaisuus kirja. Good. Once again. <laughs> yeah, it's a really odd language. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
to change their consciousness uh, dealing with Greece. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that is a bit too uh, too late. I think the issue around the consciousness that you you can't really use coercive forces there. <laughs> so so I think uh, it, what it really calls is that they would you know accept their own reality, which is of course hard, and it looks like as if. Uh, they need to go even deeper in their own crisis before they realize that they cannot look outside and blame on others when they should really look themselves and, and, and accept the reality as it is. And I don't know how much the European bankers can do that, uh, you know, and, 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 but of course what they can do in a way is that support the sort of own self-reflection by saying that, well, you know, there is no other way out than to um, accept that you have to start to deal with your own problems. Um, and of course, that's tough in a situation where they are, but uh, we all know also that, well, a lot of that problem that occurs in, the, in the Greece is a, actually, it's a, it's a problem that has been sort of a, been built over the decades. I think it's a 30 years, actually 35 years of development come to this point. And of course, it never had happened this way unless there has been a, a goal that came from, from the from the Euro country. So Noah really realized that up the point when they were entering the monetary union, they were already in a really bad situation. And of course the control mechanism should have been taken place there, but there was there wasn't there. So now we are very in the consequence. Well, one of the anecdotal things is that when they entered the monetary union, they needed to present the public budget. And they did it. They presented the public budget with all the expenditures to the European Commission without the military expenses. And it was <laughs> undiscovered for a few years. <laughs> it was not a sort of a dual problem in the beginning. It is more like the anecdotal thing. So we should not probably speak too much about Greece. Uh, but maybe one, 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 one little problem. comment on that, because I think it comes also to this uh, face in the reality is that I have done a couple of European projects where, where the Greeks have been a part of that, but sometimes they, they, they we have needed the, the statistics in Greece. And uh, we never get the numbers that we are happy about. Whatever there is that we need. So I think there has been a kind of this, this really, really badly driven um, statistics behind which which is which is the part of the problem, but uh, well, let's get, but let's not get more into that. So, okay. Peter, um, Peter James, you say, well, thank you very much. I've got sort of various things I'd like to ask. Can I just pick three briefly? One is right at the beginning. You started about California and talking about water shortage. Yeah. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking, is, is that sort of an environmental problem, or is it as much a government's problem? Because I was thinking it's not like the Netherlands, where you know, they have a problem about protecting most of the country from the sea. Yeah. They do take a long-term coordinated view. Maybe if they had that sort of system of governance and thinking, maybe they wouldn't be in the problem they were in California. So I'm wondering how much it's an environmental problem, or the fact that it's more run by the private sector, and that it isn't joined up in the same way that, that maybe that issue might be addressed in a country like that. Well, you are absolutely in the <laughs> right track. Um, um, because in, in California, what has happened, and I, I have a, I've been talking with the people, there is what they call the RAND, um, it's a research and, and, and development corporation, which was um, a Pentagon-driven research organization that were actually a number of, of, of these methodologies that we use in the future studies, like a scenario building was, was, was originated. In the 50s and 60s. Now, there are some people uh, there who have been investigating this, and they said that the real problem lies in the fact that ever since 50s and 60s, there has been not much done to the infrastructure that holds the system. And that's about the water, that's about the electricity, as well as that is much also actually about but, but the road system. Um, and now, uh, they say that uh, because of this, uh, if you think, how, what, what, was, what was California in the mid-60s? If I remember that right, there were something like 50 million people at that time. Now they have close to 40 million. And when you add that, the, the, 
the, the, the, the increase of the consumption and so forth and so forth, which, however, have not been taken into real serious count from government, by, by and through the government. Uh, so when you, when you look at the culprits, that's obviously the government and who should have waken up to this situation much, much earlier than they, than they did. And in that way, it's much, much more a, a social problem than it is about the environment. Sorry, can I? Can I um, yes. The second one, um, a lot of talk recently about the circular economy. Do you see that as part of the solution, or do you see that as an extension of old thinking trying to build a new problem? No, circular economy, of course, we have a lot of different interpretation there, but. But basically, I think the circular economy touches the heart of the matter, which is that you have to understand the loops of the system, and, and you have to understand the material and energy, how, how, it, how it actually wanders in the system. And, and I think that's a part of the new thinking that we definitely need. Um, the problem with the, with the circular economy is that for the time being, it's it's a it's a pretty loose concept. We we know that there has been the kind of the first real sort of investigation, like LMA part of what nation. I think they they did a great work by giving the kind of a, um, a, a a kind of a face to the concept. But I think we have to go much much more deeper into understanding what's what's really in there. Uh, but I think the concept is highly useful and. Uh, and seriously, I think um, that that that's um, to understand the complexity of the problem. We need to, something like this. We can give it a, a different name, but it's still something like this. I give you an, 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 a quick example of that. Now that we are getting into the summer, I give you the picture of my wife. <laughs> <You miss up. laughs> so uh, here is all around the sea. When you go, uh, typically in Ju Ju uh, July, July the late uh, July, which is the, the time people are out in the vacation, and you go to the Finnish archipelago these days, <clears throat> and you go to the western part of Finland to the archipelago. Um, it's most likely that you will, what you will come up with this, this kind of a large masses of algae in, in this beautiful sea. And now we have the tendency in Finland to say that, well, it all comes because there, there are the St. Petersburg uh, and, and the sewage system which is not working and they are just, you know, getting all, the, all, all their dirt and stuff into the water itself. Well, that's not true actually anymore and that's because we have been helping them. But the real problem is, and it's about the Finnish agriculture. So 85% of the, of the real cause of that comes actually right from the Finnish agriculture, which, which, which are giving too much of the nutrition to the water and, and, and thus. So, and now it's becoming slowly but surely as a realization, yes, it's, it's really about us and we should be doing something about it. While it was been for years discussion that no, no, it's nothing to do with us. And so when we, get, when we get to understand, which is really about understanding the loop, and, and, and when we have the first demonstration now that, well, the, the worst, in addition to the, uh, to the farms, are the fisheries. Now they are, are the first fisheries that have come up with a solution that, well, actually they can use the residues or the food that is left out from the, from the fish to actually to, to have that as a manure for the greenhouses. So they have put the greenhouses there as well to grow whatever, <coughs> cucumbers and tomatoes. Now this sort of thinking starts, and then that's what I have been seeing that starts to apply, and, and that goes back to this idea of a circular economy, which I said. I find very, very useful. Two more questions over there. Bruce, then you. Um, you've already mentioned about old, old infrastructure and old thinking. Yeah. Um, do you think we have to move towards more internalization of the cost of the damage we made into our products and services so that we get a true cost? Absolutely. 
And would it, would it also follow that we should move burden of taxation maybe from income onto products and services? Yeah. Would that be a radical change? Absolutely. And, um, well, I didn't have time to go into that, but that's the part of the, of the thinking in the economies that has to be changing. And you see, I see also in this way a kind of a, kind of a situation where if, if, if you change the society as this kind of a trinity that there is the, the, the cultural sphere, the political sphere, and the sphere of economics. And you think that, well, in the light of, um, of the ideas of the enlightenment and um, the modernity itself, you might say that, well, when you look at the cultural sphere, you see that everywhere the principle of culture, which is that there needs to be a free expression of the world, of the word, if if that is being threatened, for instance, like nowadays in Russia, people are screaming. They think it's not right. So everybody seems to agree that there is something fundamentally wrong. And I think to some extent this goes also to the political and social sphere when you think about what's the principle that is working there, which is the principle of equity, or, or I would say equality, so, sorry. So we accept that there needs to be a certain amount of equality in our society, otherwise it does not work. And I think there is a very, very, you have to go very, very street, extreme into the political map if you are saying something against <clears throat> so there's an agreement again. But when you go to the economic part, what would you think that is the principle of economy that we should be having? These are we how it is now. To me, it's like this. The principle of economy should be, as radical as it sounds, solidarity. In more practical sense, we're talking about the collaborative economy. Economy has been always, in its sort of a more, I would say, also ancient form, based on collaterals, interaction. Now, this economy we're talking about today talks about the competitive edge. Talks about the growth at any price. So, if we see where our society is most fundamentally wrong, it's about economics. And that is an, a true explanation why we are so far from anything that we call sustainable economics. And of course, the essential, essential part of becoming collaborative and becoming uh, a field which is actually supporting society in the right way and not depleting all its resources is what you were mentioning about how to calculate the cost. And it's a part of this kind of what I sometimes call the rip-off economy, which has been, um, um, of course, uh, supported by neoclassic economists that help us to actually to shield the truth from what the economy should be really about. And, and this is the massive shift of consciousness that we need to have there, but of course, the more extreme we get with our indebtedness and the realization that, um, that this is not simply the right way to run our economies, the more we come to realize that, yeah, well, actually, in the end, economy is our circulation system, and the circulation system should work as the joints and the limbs and the veins in our, you know, in our body works which is really about the collaboration. It's very difficult to make a proof of what the external costs are. It's usually like an uphill battle and you need to define all the methodologies of yeah. how you deal with the 
value of nature with the non-market value, etc. And the, the higher these costs get, the more uncertainties you usually find. And if you look at the Stern Review and many of the other great reports about all these negative externalities, mm -hmm. then uh, almost hard to imagine that any politician has the courage mm -hmm. to start internalizing those externalities. So probably a kind of quest for a balance and dealing with the uncertainty surrounding the methodologies also is very fair. So that's something we need to um, crack here at the Institute for Sustainable Resources, but also at UCL with the great heritage of David Pierce. Yeah, and right. So sort of mm -hmm. made the methodologies to calculate the external. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to make my question in a moment, but just responding to that point. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm Andrew Curry from the Futures Company. The problem with all of that kind of calculation of analysis is really the 21st century problem in 20th century language. You know, actually, if we have the values shift, the consciousness shift that uh, Mark who had in the Hoggins talk, actually we wouldn't be arguing about how much these things cost anymore. We'd just be arguing about the moral economy rather than the, uh, you know, the, the, the classic classical economy. Um, what I was just getting, the, the question is actually about values. Um, because there's sort of two halves to your talk. You know, the first half is the Contratio for H, which is very much rooted in economics and technology and innovation. And yeah. there's lots and lots of quite hard data about that, although I know some yeah. people still argue about some of the turning points. But the other half, consciousness maybe, that's a California <laughs> way of talking about it. Values maybe if you're British and you don't like talking about <laughs> consciousness so much. <laughs> there's kind of less data on that. I mean, you know, people like Eaglehart have talked about a shift towards post-materialist values from modern values from traditional values, and you can sort of map that back onto some of the last two or three waves, but it's still a kind of a bit of a kind of blurred area. Do you think we need more research into value shifts to actually make this model work better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and, and a great point. And if I had, had more time, I would love to have gone more <laughs> into that. But I think uh, Inlehart uh, has done a great work. So. If there are some who don't know what the Inglehart has done. I mean, Ronald Inglehart he put the, something that's called Old Value Survey somewhere in the 70s, already up, and then they have done this, the regular um, updates uh, on global values, namely that they have these nodes all around the world uh, where they're collecting uh, the data concerning these values, so empirical data. And, and what's really interesting is there uh, is that it, it it's basically works on, on two axes, uh, the matrix that they are building. Which one is the, the matrix which shows that the amount that, 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 that people are moving from collective to individual values. So it's this value, uh, value mat, uh, axis. And then there is another value axis up here where uh, you have um, here people who, who strongly believe in, um, um, uh, in, in God, so whatever you call it, and here on the, on the other end you have a more secu I mean secular thinking. And now every society and every region can be um, um, illustrated on this matrix in where they stand on this on this on these two parameters, and 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 to me, for instance, to understand the kinds of discussions that are going on, for instance, in the United States, can be only understood that they are in a very different part in the matrix vis-a-vis uh, -vis the standard European society. Well, the Protestant Europe, so in my part of Europe, happens to be on the on the on the, on the right upper hand corner, but also the other 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 societies are pretty much up here. So it's the different values that makes it that there are just simple different question issues that that are matter to people. But um, but this comes back actually to your your easy value. Actually, what what explains the consciousness and the shift of the consciousness. So why do this change? Because there is now a 30 years of, t uh, of time scale of data just to show that there has been actually a, a definite shift in, in those values. 
and it's somehow very logical the way that it it, it moves in in this in these matters. Um, but again, uh, it's a bit different question to 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 say that. Well, also, Ryan, you were saying that. Well, um, we, I started off with a with a with a contractive cycles and, and, and talking about technology and technology shift. While at the end, I, I come up with talking about <laughs> consciousness change, which is of course might look as a paradox, but it's not really um, because I think whatever you strive to you know to kind of um, read the history. There is basically two ways to do that. The one way is that you think that you okay first your consciousness change, then new phenomena start to happen, or the first you invent something like a technology and tool, and then your consciousness change. And there is this I don't know two ta probably two thousand years ever since from Aristotle there has been this discussion and which comes first. <laughs> And, and probably we are not, we cannot uh, sort of uh, um, uh, crack this problem tonight, but, but uh, <clears throat> to me it's always been kind of a obvious that first the consciousness changed and then you have the implications out there in society. So you might also say that, well, while the railroads became uh, 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 a, a great um, issue and the topic in the early 19th century, and well, it became because there were certain conditions, um, uh, sort of material conditions, but I think those material conditions, like uh, having the, the, the steam engines and the stuff, would have never happened unless there had been an idea that, well, let's have this stretch to be done not just with the horses, but with something else which is much more productive. And I think I think it goes back to this way. But well, maybe let's not. Well, probably certainly also the financial system changed that for the first time it was possible to pull many financial resources into the industrial system by some institutional innovations, I want to call it this way, and yeah. I'm just reminded of the whole theory of Douglas C. North, who introduced the idea that the bigger changes were always driven by those institutional changes that came into the uh, sort of overall economic change. So it was probably a multi-dimensional uh, system that came with technologies, mm. came with conscious change, but also with some of the larger institutional changes, like yep. introducing stock market exchanges in the Middle Age, like mm -hmm. introducing larger insurance companies that were able to finance mm -hmm. and to ensure the, the transatlantic trade in the early ages, etc. Yeah, yeah. So lots of things that are interesting. There's one more statement than here. Yeah, it's not a it's more statement than a question actually. I just yeah. wanted I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I uh, so I started the company a year ago and I'm I am i just wanted to thank you because it's really it was really interesting and I realized actually I was in the right <laughs> innovation with you know, we are trying to uh, be efficient with the electricity using algorithms. So, you know, mm -hmm. And uh, digital technology, smart technology. I think I can, we can talk about it later. Yeah. But so it's 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 really interesting. And as mentioned before, uh, I'm also, but more on a personal level, very interested about the consciousness. You know, conscious capitalism and the, the link you do between the two. Mm. For me, it's totally new, and I really like it. Uh, mm. it really makes sense. So I, I wanted to thank you and just uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, more issues here. Um, I would suggest we try to finish, but we could also follow the conversation and over a glass of wine upstairs. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wish to raise right now here publicly? Briefly, yeah, sure. Because you can talk about economics, changes, the future changes. How much do you see the mainstream orthodox economists able to cope with a full paradigm shift, to cope with climate change? Mm. For example, oil needing to keep four fifths, four fifths of it in the ground to avoid uh, uh, terrible climate change. Mm. Mm. Do you see orthodox economists mm. are, are, are changing, are able to see the need for a, a major paradigm shift? Yeah, very good question. And um, um, I give you a brief, a brief example of this kind of a change that is occurring. Uh, 
but this this sample is more about understanding the complexity. So there was this one economist <coughs> called Nuria Rubini, who was, to my understanding, the only one that really foresaw financial crisis to come. And I could see that because I was at that time when a financial crisis came. I was I was with Allianz, which is one of the greatest financial investors in the whole world. Now, we didn't see that coming at all. Uh, this guy saw that. And it was, it was, then I started to investigate why did he see that, but no one else, and particularly no other economist could see that. And there were a number of things. The first thing was that he's, he's a cosmopolitan and he has been living in all parts of the world. So he had the experience, for instance, which was very important to him, of the 19th in Asia, where there was a similar collapse at the end of the 90s with a, with a then called Asian Tigers. And then he saw in 2004 that the same pattern is now happening to the United States. But when he went out uh, in public to say that, it was just ridiculous. Uh, even if he could, you know, pinpoint, you know, exactly the same pattern, just people just didn't want to believe that. And then he went further on to see that okay, this pattern repetition is going further and further, so now he can actually, and that was when he said in the early 2008, two of the great financial giants are going to collapse before the end of this year, which is exactly what happened. And why he was able to see that was, as I said, two things, the patterns, but also he could see that there was no one who was in the control of the markets. Because at that time we didn't talk about only about the US markets, we were talking about the global markets. And there was no control mechanism over there. So no one was actually looking after the system we're talking about. And he said, and he has been saying ever since, that well, it's the simple thing that when, again, about the system thinking, so if you have the complexity there, in our world, we always need to have a, 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 a control mechanism which is able to govern that system. Otherwise, things always get out of hands. If we don't have that balance, it doesn't work. And that's what this guy observed. And, uh, and I don't know if we have really learned about it, and this goes now back who has uh, about the economists. Of course, we know that some economists, even in this, in this great country, have understood that there, uh, that, 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 that there is something to do with the climate change and, and economies as such, and, and being uh, doing the calculation. So I think it's a, it's a beginning, but it's, of course, the small, very small fraction of economists that, that are taking that seriously. Unfortunately, but I think we we'll get them more as, as the things become tougher. Please come and talk to our Chancellor of the Exchequer. You were referring to even our country here. I was indeed also reminded that this has been the country that invented the, 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 the balance of power, the checks and balances principles and also the parliament is constructed in a way that you usually have those two strong parties but time has changed and the government has been re-elected and there might be good reasons to rethink the habit of re-electing governments etc but I don't want to go into this more political discussion I would like to close this part of our round here by thanking you indeed